بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد رضي الله عن المؤمنين إذ يبايعونك تحت الشجرة فعلم ما في قلوبهم فأنزل السكينة عليهم وأثابهم فتحا قريبا ومغانم كثيرة يأخذونها وكان الله عزيزا حكيما وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم لا يدخل النار أحد ممن بايع تحت الشجرة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters The topic that we have at our final discourse this evening Is something that is very integral and pertinent to the faith of a believer Nay, it is the cornerstone of our iman and that is honoring, respecting, and revering the noble companions of the Prophet ﷺ. One might wonder at the onset, this is an accepted fact, it's part of our faith, what's the need to emphasize the topic? You would be amazed and perplexed to know, in many a so-called Islamic faculties that supposedly offers Islamic diplomas, one has to study the life of the Prophet Sallallahu as an ordinary man of history without the honoring and revering of his blessed name. In fact, one particular student from a tertiary institution came to me and he said, Sheikh, I intend pursuing Islamic studies not at a traditional institution, but rather a so-called tertiary reputable institution but one of the prerequisites is that reference to the Master وسلم, cannot be made as I have done so now. And you have to say Muhammad and that's it. I said, my brother, will your faith and your iman ever allow you to take the name of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een without invoking the blessings and the mercy of Allah upon him? And hence, it's very important and integral that we understand. Bishr ibn Harith rahmatullah used to say, "Awthaku amali fi nafsi hubbu ashabi Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam." I consider the strongest action in my life for my salvation, my love for the noble companions. If I have a hope that any action would rescue me on the day of Qiyamah then it is my love and my attachment for the noble companions of the Prophet ﷺ. The Arabic poet said, Inni uhibbu aba hafsin wa shi'atihi kama uhibbu atiqan sahib al-ghari wa qad raditu aliyan qudwatan wa ma raditu bi qatli al-shaykh fi al-dari kullu al-sahabati sadati kullu al-sahabati sadati fahal aliyya bi hadha al-qawli min aari إِنِّي أُحِبُّ أَبَا حَفْسٍ وَشِيْعَتِهِ I love Umar and I'm fond of the family of Umar. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu said, Ibn Sa'd makes mention of the narration. أخرج ibn Sa'd an Abi Wa'il قال قدم إلينا قدم إلينا Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu فنعا إلينا Umar. He says that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came to us and conveyed to us the sad news of the death of Umar radiallahu anhu فَلَمْ أَرَى يَوْمًا كَانَ أَكْثَرُ بَاكِيًا وَلَا حَزِينًا مِنْهُ In my life, I never seen a day where there was more crying and tearing than the day Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu passed away. And then he expressed his bond for Sahaba. And he said, وَاللَّهِ لَوْ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ عُمَرْ كَانَ يُحِبُّ كَلْبًا لَأَحْبَبْتُهُ Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, If I had to know that Umar was fond of an animal, I would become attached to that animal just out of the respect of Umar radiallahu anhu. 
قَدْ وَجَدَ فَقْدَ عُمَرْ And I honestly believe today as Umar has passed on, it's not only the humans that lament the death of Umar. For all I care, the earth is equally crying. And so are the trees around us mourning the death of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Alqama ibn Marthad rahmatullah alayhi says, انتَهَ الزُّهْدُ إِلَى ثَمَانِيَ مِنَ التَّابِعِينَ انتَهَ الزُّهْدُ إِلَى ثَمَانِيَ مِنَ التَّابِعِينَ Abstinence from this world, while it was a common feature amongst our pious predecessors, but this was found to an optimum level in eight of the tabi'een. Who was this? Amongst them was Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah. Then he goes on to describe Hassan basri rahmatullah alayhi. He said, مَا رَأَيْنَا أَحَدًا مِنَ النَّاسِ كَانَ أَطْوَلُ حُزْنًا مِّنْهُ He was a man who was perpetually gripped in grief. مَا كُنَّا نَرَاهُ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ حَدِيثُ عَهْدٍ بِمُصِيبَةٍ Whenever we would look at him, it would appear to us as if he had a fresh calamity. Then he went on to say, نَضْحَكُوا وَلَا نَدْرِي لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ اطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ أَعْمَالِنَا فَقَالْ لَا أَقْبَلُ مِنْكُمْ شَيْئًا We sit and gossip and laugh, chat and socialize, and we know not perhaps Allah has declared the rejection of our actions. Then he went on to say, I had the good honor in my life of meeting 70 companions of those who participated in Badr. Wallahi laqad adraktu sab'een badriyan. I had the privilege of meeting 70 sahaba who participated in Badr. Then he gives a brief description of them. Aktharu libasihim as-suf. By and large, they would clad themselves in a simple garb of woolen texture. Aktharu libasihim as-suf. Walau ra'aytumuhum, qultum majaneen. Walau ra'aw khiyarakum, laqalu ma liha ulai min khalaq. Walau ra'aw shirarakum, laqalu ma yu'minu ha ulai bi yawm al-hisab. He said, if you had to see the Sahaba, due to the fact that you have deviated from the teachings, you would instantly arrive at the conclusion and say, Allah forbid, I am adding that word, these people look like they are insane. On the reverse, flip the coin, if the Sahaba had to look at you, then he categorizes the humans, that is us, in two categories, the noble and the wicked. He said, if the Sahaba had to see the cream of your crop, the best amongst you, they would instantly arrive at the conclusion, these individuals are bereft of virtue in its entirety. That's the good amongst you. And if he had to ever see, if the Sahaba had to see the sinful amongst you, they would instantly conclude by saying, these people are not believers, they don't believe in Allah. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ أَقْوَامًا كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا أَهْوَنُ عَلَىٰ أَحَدِهِمْ مِنَ التُّرَابِ تَحْتَ قَدَمَيْهِ A common thread of the Sahaba was, the world was more trivial to them than the sand beneath their shoe. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ أَقْوَامًا يُمْسِي أَحَدُهُمْ وَمَا يَجِدُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا قُوتًا فَيَقُولْ لَا أَجْعَلُ هَذَا كُلَّهُ فِي بَطْنِ It would be evening, and a sahabi would have a meager meal, but his conscience wouldn't allow him to consume the entire meal. And he would say, I need to find someone that is destitute, that is poor, a pauper, and I can share my meal with him. They would go out in the search for a pauper and a beggar, but by Allah, they were a greater pauper than the beggar they found. By Allah, they were a greater pauper than the beggar they found. And they would then divide that meal in half, giving half to that beggar, who by definition of poverty was above the bar in which they lived. But they would pass half the meal on to him, eat the other half, and that is how they would live. Rabbi ibn Khuthaym was one of the great tabi'een that history has seen. The giant Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to say, and conferred the accolade upon him, لَوْ رَآكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ لَأَحَبَّكَ what a, test, what a testimony. A man like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was groomed on the lap of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ سَرَّهُ أَنْ يَقْرَأْ 
القرآن رتبا كما أنزل فليقرأ على قراءة ابن أم عبد If anybody wants to preserve the Quran as revealed then follow the recital of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Abdullah ibn Mas'ud gives testimony in favor of this man who was not a Sahabi and he says to him my brother you know you did not see the Prophet وسلم, but I can stand guarantee had the Prophet of Allah seen you he would have immensely loved you he would have loved you sometimes we say to a child you know you were born and your grandfather passed away or this uncle of yours passed away if he was alive oh you would have had a wonderful time because he loved kids and I know your nature he loved children like you imagine the testimony of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he says to Rabi ibn Khutaym if Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was alive he would have loved you Rabi ibn Khutaym describing the Sahaba says أدركنا أقواما كنا في جنوبهم لصوصا. We seen the group of Sahaba. Really, we feel like liars and thieves and thugs when we dare make a comparison to their nobility. عون ابن عبد الله رحمة الله عليه said, من كان قبلكم كانوا يجعلون للدنيا ما فضل عن آخرتهم. وَإِنَّكُمْ تَجْعَلُونَ لِآخِرَتِكُمْ مَا فَضُلَ عَنْ دُنْيَاكُمْ He said in a simple, let me tell you what's the difference between Sahaba and you. مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ كَانُوا يَجْعَلُونَ كَانُوا يَجْعَلُونَ Those who preceded you, they devoted their key resources, the chunk of their assets towards Akhirah. And if anything remained, then they channeled it towards this world. You've reversed the whole theory. You devote the chunk to this world, the core and the key, the essence and the main aspect. And if anything remains, then you channel it towards this, to, towards Akhirah. Muhammad ibn Simak rahmatullah was sitting in a gathering. Harun Rashid was present. The topic of pious predecessors came into discussion. He said, ما يساوي ألف من الخلف واحدا من السلف. A thousand of us cannot equate one of our pious predecessors. And I'm going to come to a very critical point in my presentation today. But let me signal the alarm bells at the onset. And that is, the Prophet ﷺ had forewarned, and he had prophesied an error, where the latter part of this ummah, in addition to their feebleness and their weakness and their inability, they will start condemning and criticizing the pious predecessors to the extent their condemnation will go against my Sahaba as well. He said, إِذَا ذُكِرَ الْقَدْرُ فَأَمْسِكُوا Tibrani Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrates it. When people touch the topic of predestination, it's delicate, it's intricate, it's very difficult to comprehend, move away from that gathering. When people get into the topic, it is a very, very intricate topic. Somebody came to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu and he said, Akhbirni anil qadri. Simplify the article of predestiny. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, Huwa bahrun amikun la talijhu. It's a deep ocean, don't dive into it. The questioner persisted. He said, Akhbirni anil qadri. Simplify the article of predestination. He said, "Huwa tariqun mudlimun la taslukhu." It's a dark road. Don't walk on it. You'll get lost. The questioner persisted. "Akhbirni anil qadri." Ali, am I doing what has been recorded, or are the angels recording what I have done? Simplify this. Tell me this whole thing. Ali radiallahu anhu said, "Sirru Allahi qad khafiya alaik." This is the secret of Allah which will remain unknown to you. Don't probe it. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا ذُكِرَ الْقَدْرُ فَأَمْسِكُوا When people start delving into this, how often we have in a social get-together, it's a barbecue and the topic gets on and it gets heated and it gets personal and then each one becomes a mufti of his own and he starts issuing verdicts on Islamic matters. Ali was what a giant in knowledge. And these are his words. وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ أَصْحَابِي فَأَمْسِكُوا And the Prophet ﷺ said, you will find a time 
where part of the social gathering will be exchanging opinions regarding the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. When you see that gathering run from there, someone came to Imam Shafi and said, between Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, who ranks more senior? And we don't shy away from the skirmishes that existed between the Sahaba. That's a reality. It's a page of our history. But nor do we taint our tongues by pronouncing verdicts on who was correct or not. What authority do I have when the Quran announces their pardon and forgiveness? When the Quran says, and every companion for him we have decreed paradise who am i when allah the almighty has pronounced his happiness in their favor imam shafi rahmatullah said the entire life of umar ibn abdul aziz who was a giant in his own field who was a great scholar who was a great asset who revived the like of Umar. Nay, it was called the second Umar. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz's entire life cannot equate the dust in the nostrils of the horse on which Muawiyah rode. Radiallahu anhu. What did Imam Shafi rahmatullahi say? The entire... How could you dare equate a man who's seen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a man who did not see? He said, "Ma yusawi alfum min al khalaf, wahidam min al salaf." A thousand of us cannot equate one of our pious predecessors. Not even going too far. And then he went on to say, "Wa ya Abu Bakr balag taqaya al i'tmar, haythu madhak al malik al jabbar. Wa ya Umar lam takun waliya, wa inma kunta walida. Wa ya Uthman." قتلت مظلوما ولم تزل مدفونا وما قولك في من وحد الله طفلا صغيرا حتى توفي كهلا كبيرا. He said, "Oh Abu Bakr, people say he is, you know, a comforter. He can console you. Abu Bakr, you reach the pinnacle of honor in terms of consoling when you had consoled the master in his cave on the journey of Hijrat." وَيَا عُمَرْ لَمْ تَكُنْ وَالِيَا وَإِنَّمَا كُنْتَ وَالِدًا Umar, you were not a ruler, you were not a governor, you were a father to the nation. You were a father to the nation. We pray and hope that once again Allah can bring fathers to rule over us. People who truly have the interests of the masses at heart. You read the lives of Umar and his biography, and you would see what was his concern and what was his motivation. وَيَا عُمَرْ لَمْ تَكُنْ وَالِيَا وَإِنَّمَا كُنْتَ وَالِدًا وَيَا عُثْمَان قُتِلْتَ مَذْلُومًا وَلَمْ تَزَلْ مَدْفُونًا O oh, Uthman, you were killed wrongly, and you remain in the mercy of Allah. And he goes on to say, وَمَا قَوْلُكَ فِي مَنْ وَحَّدَ اللَّهَ طِفْلًا صَغِيرًا How do I begin praising a man? who from the time his eyes opened, he glorified Allah till he passed away. فَهَذَا صَاحِبُ الْغَارِ وَهَذَا إِمَامُ الْأَعْصَارِ وَهَذَا أَحَدُ الْأَخْيَارِ مَدَحَهُمْ الْمَلِكُ الْجَبَّارِ وَأَسْكَنَهُمْ دَارَ الْأَبْرَارِ Here you have Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the confidant in the cave. Then you have Umar radiallahu anhu, the leader of the nation. Then you have Uthman and Ali, the two who enjoy the exclusive privilege of being the son-in-law of the greatest human that the planet Earth has ever seen. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, Antum akthar salatan, wa akthar siyaman, wa akthar ijtihadan min ashabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa hum kanu khayran minkum. Listen, oh folks, many of you might surpass the sahaba in observing fast i know of people that fast every day many of you might surpass the sahaba in prayer but remember they better than you why oh abdullah ibn mas'ud 
whom kanu azhadu fi dunya wa arghabu fi al-akhira simply because they were abstinent from this world their hearts were not attached to the embellishment and the glory and the beauty and the glitter and the glamour of this world while despite your performance of worship you remain very connected i often say sahaba with those who only wanted akhira and we are those who also want akhira sahaba were those who only wanted and we are those who also want and i don't have to tell you the difference of only and also how about a wife saying this is also my husband <laughs> how about a, a poor man doesn't have the leg to stand on although he has legis, le, legislative rights and divine permissibility let's not get into that topic but i'm saying only and also it's a world of a difference sahaba were those who only wanted akhirah abu raja raja utaridi says i came to medina qadimtu al madina fa idha an nas mujtama'un people had gathered wa idha fi wasthihim rajulun yuqabbilu ra'sa rajulin in the center i seen one person kissing another person so i nudged the man next to me i said who's the gentleman kissing and who is he kissing he said dhaka umar ibn al khattab yuqabbilu ra'sa abi bakr the man kissing that is umar and the person he is kissing that is abu bakr just look at imagine what a sight that must have been umar ibn khattab and that kiss was acknowledgement and paying tribute to abu bakr and then he fell on abu bakr and he said wallahi lawla anta ya aba bakr halakna abu bakr if it wasn't for you we the ummah would have been destroyed if it wasn't for you oh abu bakr we would have been destroyed now there is a narration that appears Ibn Ishaq makes mention of it on the strength of Ka'b Quradi Rahmatullah Ali that once a person from Kufa came to Huzaifa Ibn Yaman radiyallahu anhu and he said to him did you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said yes alhamdulillah I'm grateful to Allah I had seen him he said what did you do he said we tried our level best to comply to honor to respect his presence and whatever obligations were upon us to discharge it so this person in his claim of love and affection he started making certain loose claims he said wallahi law adraknahu the narration is in hayatus sahaba wallahi law adraknahu la hamalnahu ala a'naqina وَمَا تَرَكْنَاهُ يَمْشِي عَلَى الْأَرْضِ If we had to be present at the time when the Prophet ﷺ was alive, we would have literally carried him on our shoulders. And we would have never allowed him to put his feet down on the floor. So Huzaifa رضي الله عنه said, Brother, hold your tracks. Hold your tracks. Retract your words. Revoke your sentiments. Easier said than done. He said, if you had to be with us on the occasion of Khandaq, I don't know if you would have had the muscle to preserve your iman also. I don't know what your fate would have been my brother. Then he went on to explain. And hence I say, just as Allah selected the best land for his prophet alayhi salam and Allah selected the noblest book for his prophet alayhi salam and Allah selected the best prophet for his uh, the, the 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 best book for his prophet alayhi salam Allah equally selected the best companions for his prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam the sahaba were not ordinary people one of the mufassirin have written so beautifully Allah says in the Quran ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kunu ansar Allah kunu ansar Allah kama qala Isa ibn Maryam lil hawariyin man ansari ila Allah قال الحواريون نحن انصار الله او يو بيليف بيكم ذا هيلبرز اوف الله ذا الصحابه ريسبوندد تو ذس كول سو برومبتلي ذات ا جروب امونجز ذيم بيكام نون از ذا هيلبرز اوف الله ذات بيكام ذا اوفيشال تايتل ذي ريسبوندد سو ديليجنتلي ذات ذي وير كونفيرد ذا اكوليد ان ذا قران از ذا هيلبرز اوف الله ذن Huzaifa radiyallahu anhu started elaborating. He said it was the night of Khandaq. 
It was extremely cold. ونحن صافون قعود. We were standing in our rows. وأبو سفيان ومن معه فوقنا. And Medina is situated at a slope. Abu Sufyan and his army were on the upper end. وَقُرَيْذَةُ أَسْفَلُ مِنَّا And the tribe of Qurayza, they were staying inside. The Prophet ﷺ had diplomatic ties with them that we differ on faith, but we can respect one another's security. But in the 11th hour, they defaulted and they joined the common allies against the Muslims. And whatever measures the Muslims had instituted to fortify and insulate themselves, was again outside invasion, not taking any measures against inside, simply because there was no fear. But in the 11th hour, they now had to face a stumbling block. So Huzayfa radiallahu anhu paints the picture, creates the scenario, lays out the ground. We feared an outside attack on us, and we feared an internal attack on our women and children. He starts telling this brother, you said you'll carry the Prophet ﷺ on your shoulders. Sit down, brother. Sit down. Take a seat and listen. Wallah, we are in the tail end. We have to only harvest the fruits and eat it. Did not my master ﷺ said, he addressed the companions and he said, you will have to preserve 100% deen to be successful. And a time will come if people can only honor 10%, they will equally make it through. And today, we want to temper with Islam. And we want to adjust Islam. Remember, the Quran draws our attention to a key principle. Either I change my ego and I suppress my ego to conform with divine teachings, then that is the definition of guidance and reformation. So my ego wants to sleep the entire night. It wants to indulge in sin. It doesn't want to observe the fast. It wants to roam its gaze. It wants to womanize. It wants to do all the evil. But I, I suppress it, I, I, I destroy it, I crush it, I tame it, I discipline it. And I say divine guidance will dictate when I'll sleep, when I'll eat, with whom I'll socialize and who not. That is the definition of guidance. And the reverse of it is that I leave my ego to do what it wants and I start tempering with the laws of Allah. The Quran says, that is the recipe of destruction. And I'm afraid the world is on the brink of the recipe of destruction. The world in its entirety has come. And I'm talking with a broad brush here. I'm not isolating a community or any ethnic group. I'm saying we're challenging divine law by and large. Let's look at the commonalities between all divine scriptures and start honoring and revering the words the Almighty has said. And hopefully, we could, we could save the ship of humanity from wrecking. But for now, I'm afraid we are, we are preparing the recipe of destruction. So he says, وَمَا أَتَتْ عَلَيْنَا لَيْلَةٌ قَدْ أَشَدُّ ظُلْمًا وَلَا أَشَدُّ رِيحًا مِّنْهَا In my life, I had not seen a more dark night, a more cold night. وَهِيَ ظُلْمَةٌ it was so dark, you couldn't see your finger. And that was not an exaggerated description. And the Quran uses this phrase. You know, so many ayat Allah puts in the mind and whatever I can share, inshallah, by the will of Allah, I will share. Where Allah speaks about the layers of darkness in the life of a person who doesn't believe in Allah, a person who has sins, vice, transgression in his life. One brother one day told me a very beautiful thing and it hit me so hard. He said, what is the most disturbing moment in the life of an agnostic, in the life of an atheist? I said, tell me. He said, after owning everything, he has no one to thank. What, what a hollow moment that must be. Whoever it is, when, when you re realize you've recovered, your marks are true, your daughter is fixed, your child is proposed, whatever immediately that inner body just calls out to a supreme being and you fall down but what happens to this what happens to this so the quran speaks about the layers of darkness in the life of a person in who's living a life of sin and vice and transgression <laughs> موج من فوقه سحاب 
ظلمات بعضها فوق بعض إذا أخرج يده لم يكد يراها ومن لم يجعل الله له نور فما له من نور How profound are the words of the Quran The Quran says it is like layers of darkness in his life and Allah then gives a parable a person in the depths of the ocean it's the dead of night it's the cover of darkness upon him is a wave upon that wave is another wave upon that wave is the layer of darkness and upon that is clouds and gloom Allah says this is the life of this individual he is engulfed with so much darkness if he exposes his hands it's very unlikely for him to even spot his own hand again appreciate the grammar of the quran allah didn't say he cannot see allah said lam yakad yaraha he won't even get close to seeing it and the scholars say allah uses the phrase of the hand the hand is such an organ that you can draw close to your eye unlike the foot the hand you can draw so close meaning he is engulfed embroiled surrounded by so many layers of darkness and then the quran concludes if a person is not favored with divine celestial light from allah no amount of physical lightning can bring brightness to his heart if a person does not have a divine glow from allah if he doesn't have divine brilliance from Allah, my Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whom Allah had given the greatest level of light and brightness, brilliance and radiance, who was illuminated by divine light. But what was his prayer when he embarked for the early morning fajr? Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi noora wa fi sam'i noora wa fi basari noora wa fi lahmi noora wa fi dami noora wa fi sha'ri noora wa fi asabi noora wa min fawqi noora wa min tahti noora Allahumma a'tini noora Oh my Allah, oh my Allah, instill that bright light in my eyes so through this eyes, I see your greatness only. Oh my, div oh my Allah, put that light in my ears. Oh my Allah, put it on my tongue. Oh Allah, put it in my flesh. Oh Allah, put it in my bones. Oh Allah, put it in every an anatomy of my body. Oh my Allah, let it sink down on my right, on my left, in my front, in my rear. Oh my Allah, surround me with this light. What don't we have today? We have everything of this world. We don't have this divine light. And thus, it comes from the top. It's inspired. And it's inspired on particular actions. And unfortunately, we are not ready to make the bold step to bring those actions in our life. If Allah doesn't give you that divine light, and your mind doesn't open up to that truth, and this, this camouflage, and the smoke screening of the world, and the superficial image of this world is not lifted away from you, and you become spiritually blinded, then the Quran says you can hit such a low, you can hit such a low in deviation. There are those amongst them who are devoid of an iota of light and they reach such a low in darkness that if we cause the deceased to stand up from the grave and every dead man narrates his tale to the living thereby convincing him on the truth of life after death and we send the angels down from the heavens وَحَشَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ قُبُلًا And we put paradise and hell before them. لَقَالُوا إِنَّمَا سُكِّرَتْ أَبْصَارُنَا لَقَالُوا إِنَّمَا سُكِّرَتْ أَبْصَارُنَا بَلْ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ مَسْحُورُونَ They will conclude by saying, You have cast a spell on my eye. We are a bewitched nation. We are under spell. We've been mesmerized. This is not the truth. I am made to see something that doesn't exist. 
In English they say, none can be more blind than he who does not want to see. And none can be more deaf than he who does not want to listen. Oh, Muhammad Sassam, would you able to convince the deaf man? And that also when he turns his back. Look at the eloquence of the Quran. Coming back to the topic, Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu. He says, it was so dark I couldn't see my finger. The munafiqeen joined us. And then when they realized things were getting critical, the moment was getting daunting, they deserted and they launched us. And our numbers were considerably reduced. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted some information from the opposite camp. So he said, مَن يَذْهَبُ فَيَأْتِينَا بِخَبْرِهِمْ جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ رَفِيقِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Who will stand up and do me a favor, just go to the opposite camp, intercept the information, update me what happenings, and I promise he will walk with me in paradise and he will be my friend. Not one sahabi stood up. He then repeated it and he said, who will stand up, go to the opposite camp, intercept the information and report to me. Allah will make him my friend in paradise. Nobody took on the challenge. Why? None stood up. The hunger, the pangs of hunger was so severe and the cold was so biting. That Huzaifa radiallahu anhu said, many of my companions dug a hole in the ground. They hid themselves inside, took their shield and covered the ground and they tried to d derive warmth from the earth. So critical, so challenging. And he's addressing this brother and he said, you would have carried the Prophet Sassam on your shoulders. Is that what you said? Great. Great, my brother. You know, often we want to sit back and we want to criticize and we want to pronounce verdicts and we want to say, I wish the Muslim rulers can unite and you know what, they can forget their bickering, but I cannot go across the road and patch up with my brother and I cannot move my differences in a family circle and I'm expecting it to happen on a macro level when I cannot execute it on a micro level. I cannot remove the internal bickering, make the step now, make the change now. What we say, no, no, I forgive, but I cannot forget. I read a nice quote. To tell someone I will forgive you, but I cannot forget, is just another way of saying I will not forgive. To tell someone I will forgive you, but I cannot forget, is another way of saying I will not forgive. He said the Prophet ﷺ then came, one by one, until finally he came to me. He looked at me, he said, is this Huzaifa? I would a very croaky voice and you know weakness and feebleness and extreme cold i said yes O prophet of allah this is the humble servant huzaifa he said stand up i had no choice in the matter La dua -ar ka dua ba do not consider the call of a nabi like an average call as soon as he calls you it now is elevated with divine connotations it now becomes a divine call the implications are much more serious and severe. That is why one day the Prophet ﷺ was walking with a Sahabi and someone was sleeping and it was the time of prayer. The Prophet ﷺ told that Sahabi, go and awaken him. Because while he's sleeping, he might blurt something. Rather he blurts it to you than me. If he blurts it to me, I'm afraid of his faith. So having pity on him, having pity on him. That is why I read about one scholar and it hit me so hard. You know, because these things in theory are very easy. He said, again, we were talking of parents yesterday. This is a very, very deep message. Obviously, this is for the parents and the child shouldn't be telling his dad, Dad, did you hear that? Because then, then we're losing it. The pious scholar said, I never instructed my children in my life. Because if they fail to honor my instruction, it constitutes disobedience for which they will be punished. So whenever I needed anything, I gave them an option. So even if they choose to deny, Allah won't punish them because it was an optional matter. My son, if you don't mind and you're okay with it, could you kindly get me a glass of water? 
He said, I never, because as soon as you say it as a father, it now assumes a weighty position. That's the teachings of Islam. I mean, look at, look at the eye of the pious. And another scholar of mine recently told me something very amazing because I asked him for advice in terms of raising children. He said, my advice to you is that while raising and nurturing your children, you will have the moments where there will be rage, there will be fury, there will be anger. And remember, my advice is as much as you discipline and you chastise them, forgive them. Because if you don't forgive them, this will set them back in the eyes of Allah and they will become a victim to divine wrath and that punishment of Allah upon them because of their disobedience will hurt you even more. So the only way out is as much as they provoke you, discipline and forgive. Discipline and forgive, least it attracts divine wrath. If you hold it in your heart, you know my son, you've upset me, I'm going to hold it in my heart. You hold it, immediately there's divine connotation and it will have consequences. That consequences will hurt the individual but will hurt the parent even more. So you have to, and it's, it's not easy. I'm, I'm talking now with the cap of a father here. I'm talking with the cap of a father. It's not an easy task where son provokes you. But in his interest, it's better for you to discipline and forgive. At least the consequences are severe. These were just some advices that came by the way. Inshallah, we apply it. It will be beneficial and wholesome to us all. The Prophet said, stand up. I had to stand up. And he said, to add salt to injury. Amongst all my colleagues, I was the one that felt the most hunger and the most cold. Had it been anyone else, he could have got away. He didn't feel. Some people feel more hungry and cold. So me as a person, I feel extremely cold. And the Prophet said, stand up and just intercept the information and come back. I said, okay, that's perfectly fine. I stood up. He then made a prayer for me. When my Nabi opens his blessed lips, before he articulates it, it's accepted. Before he pronounces it, it's accepted. Before he suggests it, the Malaika have said Amin to it. It's about time I do and you do and we do that which makes us deserving of the du'as of our Nabi. It's about time. It's high time. And he's left with us actions. Do this and my prayers are with you. Do this and my blessings are upon you. Do this and I am happy with you. He said, Allahumma hafadhu min bayni yadayhi wa min khalfihi wa an yaminihi wa an shimalihi. Oh Allah, Huzaifa has responded to my call. Keep him in your divine eye. Protect him from all angles. Let no one harass him or intimidate him. Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu said, The Prophet of Allah had not completed his prayer and I felt like I was walking in a hot shower. My hunger was gone. And amazing, ironical, perplexing, around me everybody is trembling and I'm all calm and relaxed. Everybody is feeling extremely cold. To give you a logical parable to which we can relate, because unfortunately the mind today is logical. As soon as you say the mind is running, it's calculating. Is this possible? How? Why? Which? We see it how often when it is peak hour traffic and people are in a traffic jam and then there comes the president's cavalcade with choppers hovering above and everybody has to wait patiently and suddenly the sirens are blowing and the police are clearing the traffic. All are jammed in the traffic but he moves smoothly like a breeze through that traffic. This is because of synchronizing and coordinating and being a diplomat status or cavalcade or whatever it is, the entire entourage just briskly makes their way through that. And everybody just looks at them. Hosea ibn Yaman said, I was in comfort and ease and everybody's looking at me. But obviously I responded to the call and hence I became deserving of the prayer. The, we all want the prayer, but we're not ready to respond to the call. In tansurullaha yansurkum. If you aid the cause of Allah, Allah will aid you. And we are saying, Allah aid us first, then we'll help you. Ibrahim hopped into the fire. Then Allah said, قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ 
قلنا يا نار كوني بردا وسلاما على ابراهيم he hopped in Allah said become cool we are like Allah make it cool then I'll hop in Allah first you give me that barakah then I'll leave this interest you make me happy with my wife then I'll leave this illicit relation Allah give me good sleep then I'll leave my drugs no my brother no my brother I said to you you can't temper with divine guidance Whenever an individual tempered, he was destroyed. When a nation tempered, they were destroyed. When a dynasty tempered, that dynasty was destroyed. Read the pages of history. These facts will stare at you with open eyes. I stood up. I went. As I was leaving, he said, لا تحدثن في القوم شيئا حتى تأتيني. Don't do anything until you don't report back to me. I said, that's fine. حتى إذا دنوت من عسكر القوم I got in, I left نظرت ذو أنار لهم توقد I seen a fire that was kindled وإذا رجل أدهم and I see a dark skinned person يقول بيديه على النار he was warming his hands at the fire I applied my mind and I realized this was the chief leader this was the prominent personality Abu Sufyan previously I had never seen the man I had heard great about him and I knew he was spearheading all the campaigns I had a pot shot from the angle where I was. I took my arrow out of my quiver. <coughs> I placed it ready. And I said, here is absolute precision. I could release this arrow and I could strike target. I was about to release. فَذَكَرْتُ قَوْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. I had a flash of the words of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, who said to me, don't do anything until I don't tell you. I returned that arrow into the quiver. I'm saying to you, my young brother, Huzaifa ibn Yaman said, he wasn't wanted to do anything sinful. He was about to release the arrow. But immediately he had a flash of the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How about you, my young brother, when you're about to dine with a girl in a club and you're about to perpetrate the crime and you have a flash of the ayah, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا don't dare come close to immorality. How about you, my brother, when you're about to invest with interest and usury, you have a flash of the ayah, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَإِن تُبْتُمْ فَلَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ If you don't abandon, you are at war with Allah. How about you, my brother, when you're about to gamble and go into the gambling casinos, then you are reminded of the verse, إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجْسٌ مِّنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ Verily, gambling and all the related crimes and evils are impurities from the devil. فَجْتَنِبُوهُمْ what was the iman? Allah forbid. I am praying with Allah and I'm having a flesh of a woman. My whole flesh is the direct opposite. In my prayer, I'm having haram flashes and flushes also. And he says, I was about, and immediately I put it back. When this ummah will come back on following divine injunctions in its you know, most detailed form, then only will it able to raise its head from where it has dropped it. He said, I put the arrow back in. I stayed there. I observed what had happened. There was chaos in their ranks. There was really panic amongst them. There was disarray. There was disorder. The tents were flying. Allah had sent a strong wind that had erupted their tents. Abu Sufyan said, it's time we return and we move back here. We are really, we can just save ourselves from a humiliating defeat. But defeat is our lot. Let's move on to, to save ourselves from a further defeat. I intercepted the information. I did nothing more. I exited as I came out. I see 20 horsemen. They come to me, all clad in a common garb. All are wearing turbans. And they say to me, أَخْبِرْ صَاحِبَكْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ كَفَاهُ Convey our choices regards to your Prophet Wasallam. We are angels deputed by Allah. Tell him the battle is over and victory remains for the believers. And the verses were revealed. وَرَدَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِغَيْضِهِمْ لَمْ يَنَالُوا خَيْرًا 
وكف الله المؤمنين القتال وكف الله المؤمنين القتال وكان الله قويا عزيزا and Allah returned the disbelievers in fury and rage and Allah became sufficient on the fighting front and he is the mighty at all times Huzaifa ibn Yaman said I return and now his joy knows no bounds my poor companions were still trembling. The master, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was performing salah. I came to him. He acknowledged me, and then he took me in his embrace and he put his shawl and around me. And when I read this, I cry, "Wallah, Huzaifa, I am green with envy for you. I am green with envy for you." May my parents be sacrificed for you. Those moments you slept in the lap of my Nabi. I don't have the words of any language to describe the fortune that knocked your door. You slept in the lap of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see the youth of today. He wants to dine with a celebrity. He wants to fly with a celebrity. He feels honored to share podium and platform with a celebrity. Do me a favor and open up the social life of that celebrity. You will see the stench that will come out from there. I'm not talking on religious grounds. Look at the immorality in the life. And an average young man wants to assimilate and associate. Huzaifa, we salute, we honor, we revere you. May my parents be sacrificed. He said, my, lap, my head was put in his lap and then I slept. A child is taken in the hug of his mom and then he soothes. A dad rocks him and rocks him and nothing happens. And the mom latches him on and instantly calmness returns. Can you imagine that sight when Huzaifa was in the lap of my Habib? I don't know if this earth and this zameen has seen a better sight. I don't know. So he said to the man, you want to tell me that you would have carried the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Nu'aym makes mention of a narration. Abu Nu'aym makes mention of a narration in Hilya on the strength of Jubair ibn Nufayr, who narrates it from his father who says that one day we were sitting with the great companion Miqdad ibn Aswad radiyallahu anhu. And then a person passed by, a passerby. So he paused for a moment and he said, Miqdad, would you spare me the opportunity? I would love to just look at your eyes simply because it enjoys the honor of repeated glances at the greatest human. If you will be kind enough, I would just want to look at the eyes that had the opportunity of, of being focused on the greatest person. Oh, Miqdad, your eyes are so fortunate, so blessed, so awesome, so honored. Wallahi lawadidna anna ra'ayna ma ra'ayt. I wish I seen in my life once what you saw daily. Wallahi lawadidna anna ra'ayna ma ra'ayt. Wa shahidna ma shahidta. And I was present at the time in which you were present. He said this man just went on praising him and praising him. I must digress for a moment here, objective digressing, and draw your attention to a key point. Sahaba were not people that were looking for tribute. They were not people that were hungry for recognition. They were not people that were waiting for praises. And when they got it, they were not people that got flattered with it. We are unfortunately hungry for it. And when we get it, we become, you know what, inflated and flattered. And let a woman praise a man, oh boy, oh boy. Let a woman praise a man and he is inflated like you cannot believe. His ego is bloated. It massages his ego. So he said, this man is praising Miqdad and he's just quiet, very composed, very modest. No facial expression, no body language, no joy, nothing. He said, brother, are you over? He said, yeah, I'm over. 
said, can I say something? He said, please go. He said, ما يحمل أحدكم على أن يتمنى محضرا غيبه الله عز وجل عنه لا يدري لو شهده كيف كان يكون فيه I don't know why people consciously desire to be present in an era from which Allah had systematically kept them absent. I don't know why people desire to be present in a period and a time from which Allah had consciously kept them absent. Had they been present, they have no idea how they would have fared. Wallahi laqad hadara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqwam. كبهم الله عز وجل على مناخرهم في جهنم لم يجيبوه ولم يصدقوه for the record we were not the only ones that seen him thousands seen him we were the fortunate ones to believe in him what guarantee do you have if you were in Badr you were with us and not against us لم يجيبوه ولم يصدقوه أولا تحمدون الله أولا تحمدون الله إذ أخرجكم الله عز وجل لا تعرفون إلا ربكم مصدقين بما جاء به نبيكم وقد كفيتم البلاء بغيركم Why won't you express gratitude to Allah from the time you opened your eyes you knew Allah is your Lord and Muhammad is your Nabi born in a Muslim home والله لقد بعث النبي على أشد حال بعث عليه نبي من الأنبياء the Prophet ﷺ was sent in an era more challenging, more daunting than any Nabi. Fi fatratin, when the succession of Prophets had been long paused. Wa jahiliya, people were steeped in ignorance. Ma yarawna deen an afdalu min ibadati al-awthan. Paganism was common, the common order of the day. Fa jaa bi furqan. He came with the criteria that separated truth from falsehood, that divided family members, and every one of us had to contend with the bitter challenge that we knew one of our family members had not embraced the faith. So we could never sigh with relief because I had to live with the fact that my mom did not embrace the faith or my brother did not embrace the faith. And you are born in a Muslim home and you have no guarantee had you been present how you would have fared. Relax where you are, appreciate what you have and enhance the cause objectively. There's a good friend of mine in Perth, Australia. His name is Suleiman. I had a lecture there. Mashallah, an Australian revert. What a man who humbled me to tears. What a man in his character. Some people have touched me in my humble travels that will live with me. We went to his house for meals. And as we were leaving, he started crying. And I comforted him. I said, Brother Suleiman, what's the matter? He says, Shaykh, make a dua for my mom. I'm desperate for her iman. I'm desperate for her iman. If I can... You know, it brought so much tears because an average young man comes to me, Sheikh, make a dua, this deal goes through. Make a dua, this container arrives. Make a dua, I strike this. Make a dua, this. And a young man who reverted to the truth. And suddenly he had the right compass in front of him. And his navigation was giving him the correct direction. And his, his garment was, and his tom tom was now put in the right direction before him. And he said, my, my, my concern and my worry by day and by night is that my mom embraces the faith and then I can sigh with relief. So what did Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu say? You wish that you had to be present. These were the issues with which we had to contend. And now that brings me to the aspect that I had touched on. And that is... The Prophet ﷺ had said, وَلَعَنَ آخِرُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَوَّلَهَا وَلَعَنَ آخِرُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَوَّلَهَا These very illuminated individuals will become the victims of the aggression and the curses of this ummah in the latter part before Qiyamah. Yes, you've heard it right. My beloved Habib Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi min Allahi as-salawatu wa taslimat He has said that a time will come when the latter people of this ummah 
will find reason to condemn my Sahaba. Let me share with you the advice of one prominent scholar. He said, don't ever involve yourself in three arguments. These are great words of wisdom. And these words of wisdom only come at the feet of scholars. Let me tell you that. If you study Islam in a, in a faculty, in a tertiary institution, there will be words that will be transmitted without spirituality being transmitted. And remember, this is interlinked. These words are connected to spirituality. بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ What are the verses of the Qur'an? These are things that reside in the bosoms of those who carry the sacred sciences of Islam. There's a spiritual transmission. It's not conveying words only. Three arguments don't ever get yourself into. Number one, the dispute and the argument between your parents. As a junior, as a child, how dare you start deciding who's on the right and who's incorrect. It's a harsh reality. It happens in, in an average home. You might be an elderly son. You would, I would suggest you would have to engage the seniors. Behind the scenes, pray to Allah. Politely, if you have to hear the tale of both, hear the tale. But how dare you start saying, Dad, you've overstepped the mark. Mom, you're wrong. He could be wrong and she could be wrong. One has to be right and one is wrong or both might have their faults. But let it not be that you start passing judgments. This will be to your harm. When I heard this advice, I was so touched by the scholar. I prayed for him. I said, what, what profound words. Number one, the dispute the antagonism, the differences, the bickering, the uneasiness between parents. Number two, the differences between the ulama and the scholars. It's not for an average man to start tongue lashing and speaking. You don't know one Yasin by heart. That man carries the whole Quran. And not by chance, by choice. Allah has chosen him. And with respect, if I don't have it, I haven't been chosen for this honorable task. Allah has said he will preserve his deen. And whoever commits the Quran to memory, he has been taken on as an ambassador for the plan of the preservation of the Quran. Someone who has been employed and instituted by Allah and afforded the honor to be part of this honorable task. This, this great responsibility, I start pointing fingers, that's not my job. The scholars will have their differences. And behind closed doors, they need to adequately, with respect and dignity, thrash their differences. And they have to show a united front. But there will be moments where they will differ and there will be difference of opinion. Don't tarnish your reputation. Don't start siding and harming your own self. And the third... And the most serious, oh boy, oh boy, how dare you get yourself involved in the skirmishes that took place between the Sahaba. It's a reality. We will not sweep it under the carpet. Sahaba were humans. They differed. And they differed seriously. And battles were fought. And lives were lost. And there were sad days. But do I start judging? Oh my Allah! Do I open my filthy, impure tongue on Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiyallahu anhu wa arda on Hussein radiyallahu anhu this very Rabbi ibn Khuthaym the day he was a man of few words I spoke about him now tabi'i the day Hussein radiyallahu anhu was assassinated the grandson of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam people came to him and said Hussein radiyallahu anhu has been killed what a challenging day in the annals of Islamic history. People said, Al-An yatakallam. This man doesn't speak, but I think today he's going to make a statement. He said, Awaqad fa'alu. Really have they done this? Allahumma fatira as-samawati wal-ard. 
علم الغيب والشهادة أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون That's all I have to say Allah you the creator of the heavens and the earth and you will resolve all disputes on the day of Qiyamah That's my statement for you people That's it, nothing more Don't ever involve yourself in the argument of your parents We make dua that we don't see it but if we have to engage we are skating on thin ice we are skating on thin ice we need to understand the sensitivity of the situation the dispute the differences between scholars and the point of discussion which is the focus of tonight's event and discussion and that is the differences of sahaba and really i heard one scholar saying when allah decides the fall of an individual amongst the first slips that he makes his tongue becomes loose about the pious predecessors when a person is to fall and is to collapse and now his downward journey commences and he could be a graduate from anywhere amongst the first blunders that he makes in his life he starts rebelling against his seniors and he starts making bold statements and then you see how this man falls there's none to stop the decline of this man Somebody came to Ali radiyallahu anhu. Bayhaqi makes mention of the narration. He said, you people fought against the people of Jamal. Jamal was the camel because our mother Aisha radiyallahu anhu mounted onto her the camel. And it, it's, it's a very serious thing. I don't have to read this. And if I fear that my heart is inclined in one side, I shouldn't. I shouldn't because it's too sensitive. Remember the sahaba were not immune from sin. There are three categories. We have the angels. that don't have the temperament of sinning la ya'sun allah ma amarahum wa yaf'alun ma yu'marun so they are completely sinless <coughs> they cannot sin then we have the galaxy of prophets the category of prophets who by human temperament can sin but they divinely protected so human instinctively they can sin but allah protects them so they don't sin and then we have the noble companions who can sin and did sin but allah pardoned them who can sin and did sin but allah pardoned them so their paradise was confirmed in the quran i don't know if i'm going to die with iman my brother i don't know if I, i can be standing and yelling here i promise you the critical moment is when the angel of death knocks my door i beg beseech and implore my allah to favor me with the articulation of the kalima and favor all the hundreds and the thousand whoever has gathered here so the sahaba could sin and they did sin but allah pardoned them so someone asked ali radiyallahu anhu your opponents in the battle of jamal a mushrikunahum would you classify them as polytheist he said min ash-shirki farru polytheism is what they had abandoned amunafiqunahum would you refer to your opponents as hypocrites now these were obviously the the categories against whom the sahaba fought and they were muslims themselves they were sahaba he said innal munafiqina la yadhkuruna allah illa qalila munafiqin remember allah occasionally these people are engrossed in the remembrance of allah all the time he said then who are these people your opponents he said ikhwanuna ikhwanuna they are our brothers who differed with us they are our brothers who differed with us the narration of ibn asakir the narration of ibn asakir <coughs> miqdad ibn aswad radiyallahu anhu and abdullah ibn umar had an argument they had an altercation and sahaba had it amongst themselves one day two sahaba had an argument and someone said something to abdurrahman ibn auf Nabi Sallallahu said don't say that to him he's a participant of Badr don't say that to him he participated in Badr then after some time another sahabi told him something so the sahabi said oh nabi of allah you stop me from telling him but this companion has also told abdurrah abdurrahman ibn auf something nabi sallam said he has a right because they both are participants of Badr they both participated in Badr my brother you haven't seen the plains of Badr You haven't seen the plains of Badr. You were not there with my Nabi in that morning. Yawm al-Furqan, Yawm al-Taqal Jam'an, 17th of Ramadan, the scorching heat of Arabia. My Nabi with his army mobilized and went there. He said he participated in Badr. They on par, they can tell one another. 
who are you? you we don't have a leg to stand on we don't have a leg to stand on so abdullah ibn umar and miqdad ibn aswad had an altercation radiyallahu anhuma in that abdullah ibn umar he said something to miqdad ibn aswad radiyallahu anhu fashakahu al miqdad ila umar miqdad ibn aswad said okay i'll report it to your father umar radiyallahu anhu when umar radiyallahu anhu heard this فنذر عمر لا يقطع عن لسانه. عمر said let my son come here I'll cut his tongue off. He realized that this wasn't an empty threat. عمر meant what he عمر meant what he said. فلما خاف ذلك من أبيه تحمل على أبيه بالرجال. When Abdullah ibn Umar realized the seriousness of the threat of his father, he took few people and he said please calm my father down. He wants to cut my tongue off. عمر رضي الله عنه said leave me to do this. فتكون سنة. يعمل من بعدي لا يوجد رجل شتم رجلا من أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إلا قطع لسانه. I want to start this practice that if any person dares speak ill of any Sahabi, his tongue must be cut off. Today, what's our environment? You can cry tears of blood when we hear how children speak to parents. You someday want to put your head down in shame. Who's this child talking to? Partly we blame the child, partly we blame the society, partly we blame ourselves. What vulgarity we use. I often quote the poem, guard your lips when a child is near, for children repeat the things they hear. Let no ugly tone be heard, no careless talk, no angry word. For it is a gracious sin to mar the innocent. Language vulgar or unkind leaves its mark upon the mind language vulgar or unkind leaves its mark upon the mind so let your speech be wise and mild in the presence of a child fatakunu sunna yu'malu min ba'di la yujad rajulun shatama rajulan min ashabi rasulillah tibrani makes mention of a narration Two, three incidents, and inshallah, we try and draw it to a close. Qais ibn Abi Hazim radiallahu anhu says, I came to Medina. While I'm walking in Medina into the marketplace, I came to a place called Ahjar al-Zayt. For I to qawma mujtami'een, I see people have gathered around one man. And he's having a go at Ali radiallahu anhu. He's just like venting himself. He's on a run one way. Suddenly, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, the giant, the great Sahabi, who enjoyed the privilege of paradise in this earth, he came forward. Immediately, people moved by his awe. This man was given glad tidings of Jannah, and they ushered him in. He said, what's the matter here? People have congregated. He said, this gentleman, I don't know what's his issue. I don't know what's his problem. He's just having a go at the Sahabi, and he's talking one way. So he addressed him. They must know you are talking to a man who's a jannati on earth. Watch your words. Watch your words. You can, you can prove yourself to an ordinary man. But remember when you touch the wrong door, and you touch the wrong man, and you touch Allah's friend, then my friend, I pity your generations. I pity your generations. And we've seen it with our eyes. You're not always the boss. You're not always the boss. So watch yourself. Each one, myself, first. How we talk, who we talk, to whom we talk. Sometimes we have an attitude and we just blurt. We just vent ourselves. Some people, what they say? They got verbal diarrhea. So anyway, he says, what's your story? What happened to you to suddenly start cursing a man like Ali radiallahu? What are you getting in your life? What did you learn? Alam yakun awwala man aslam. Was he not the first boy to accept Islam? Alam yakun awwala man sallam ar Rasulillah. Was he not the first one to read Salah with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Alam yakun azhad al nas. Was he was he not the most abstinent of youth? Alam yakun sahib al raiyat ar Rasulillah. Was he not the man who carried the flag of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? And you know what's the reference to in this regard? The incident is long. Briefly, I'll say it to you. It was the month of Muharram when the Prophet ﷺ left in the latter part of Muharram. He went to conquer Khaybar and with him was his honorable consort, Umm Salma radiallahu anha. 
and he deputized in Medina Numaila ibn Abdullah al Layfi radiallahu anhu, the narration of Bukhari and Muslim wa akhraj al Shaykhan, and Anisin radiallahu anhu, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salla subha bi ghalas. He performed Fajr early that morning and then he left. And with him was Amir ibn Akwa radiallahu anhu, and he said, Khud lana min hunayyatik. Amir cheers on. So he sang the famous couplets, Wallahi lawla allahu mahtadayna wa la tasaddaqna wa la sallayna fa'anzilan sakinatan alayna wa thabbitil aqdama illa qayna If it wasn't for the guidance of Allah, we would have been deviated. Let mercy and tranquility descend upon us. The Prophet said, Yarhamuka rabbuk, may your Lord have mercy on you. Faqutila yawma khaybar and he passed away on the evening of khaybar. Khaybar was not a full-scale war, but there was isolated skirmishes that had taken place. Long story short, the first day the banner was given to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. A fierce battle was fought, but nothing really took place. They did not infiltrate and penetrate. When the sun set, the Prophet passed the flag on to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar engaged in the ferocious battle, but again, not to much avail. There was now confusion. There was a need of change of strategy. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Give me the flag back. Give me the flag. Tomorrow I will hand this flag over to a man who dearly loves Allah and his Nabi. And Allah and his Nabi are very fond of him. Instantly Allah will give victory at his hands and he will never flee the battle. Umar radiallahu anhu said, مَا تَمَنَّيْتُ الْإِمَارَةَ قَدْتُ إِلَّا ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ رَجَاءً أَنْ أَكُونَ مَنْ يُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ In my whole life, I never aspired for leadership. But that night I desired it. Not for the leadership, but that, that I could qualify for the accolade that Allah and His Nabi loves him. He said, that night every Sahabi cried, I wish this flag comes to me. I wish this flag comes to me. Nobody could wait for the sun to rise. The anxiety was overwhelming. Finally, it's the flush of dawn. It's the break of morning. All gather in anxiety and excitement. Iktamalat sufufuhum. Wastawat. They gather they in full number. Rajin in anticipation. They spend up silence. And the Prophet ﷺ stands there. And everybody is tipping. Who's getting this flag? And his blessed voice comes piercing through the silence. And he said, Where is Ali radiallahu anhu? Where is Ali radiallahu anhu? And the beauty of Sahaba, Allah put a thought in my mind. As soon as the Prophet of Allah said, Ali, they all said, Ali, congratulations. We aspired, but it came to you. We're happy for you. If it would have been us, yeah, son-in-law. <laughs> Daughter. Yeah, it's a family issue. <laughs> My sahaba were not like this. By Allah, they were not like this. Their hearts were clean. That is why my Nabi held Anas. He said, In istata'ta an tumsi wa tusbih wa laysa fi qalbika ghishun li ahadim min al muslimin fafal. Anas, do me a favor. Please monitor your, ma- your heart morning and evening and make sure it doesn't harbor malice for any Muslim in the morning and the evening. Anas, if you have successfully achieved this, you have revived one of my noble practices. And if you've done so, we walk together in paradise. Immediately, they, supp- they anticipated, but when they realized it was Ali's, they said, it's all yours. The incident continues. The reference and the inference was to this. He tells the person, do you know Ali carried the banner and the flag? Then he said, okay, you don't want to change. Qibla. Then he faced Qibla. I don't want to tell you, my friend, when a man who's got the confirmation of paradise, if his mouth is going to open up on a curse for you, I pity what's going to happen to you. I pity what's going to happen to you. He lifted his hands. Allahumma inna hadha yashtimu waliyam min awliya'ik. Allahumma in this hadith is in Hakim and it's mentioned Sahihun ala Sharti Shaykhain. Academic discussion, it enjoys the recognition of authenticity of Bukhari and Muslim for the benefits of scholars. Otherwise, to the general masses, it would be irrelevant. Allahumma inna hadha waliyam min awliya'ik. Allahumma inna hadha yashtimu waliyam min awliya'ik. 
فلا تفرق هذا الجمع حتى تريهم قدرتك Allah this man arrogant and blatant loud and proud haughty and arrogant he chooses to speak ill of your noble friend and in particular Ali Allah I insist let not this gathering disperse till you don't teach him a lesson and let it be a reminder till qiyamah Qais ibn Abi Hazim said Saad ibn Abi Waqqas barely ended his prayer fasakhat dabbatuhu fil ard I literally seen the earth split and the legs of his conveyance sink into the earth fan falaqa he was then flipped off fan falaqa dimaghuhu and his brain came protruding out of his head he didn't just die it was a a terrible death we literally seen with the naked eye instantly the earth split his legs of the camel of the conveyance sunk into the earth he was flipped off and then his brains came protruding wamat and he died these are the consequences of people who choose to speak ill of sahaba another incident <coughs> mughira ibn shu'ba radiyallahu anhu is sitting in kufa in a masjid sa'id ibn zaid radiyallahu anhu comes and sits next to him another person comes in and he has a go again at ali radiyallahu anhu so sa'id ibn zaid radiyallahu anhu said may yasubbu hadha who is this man talking about he said, he's talking bad about Ali radiallahu anhu. Sa'id ibn Zayd said, Ya Mughira, Ala asma'u ashab Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yusabboon, la tunkir wa la tughayir. Are you tolerating rude behavior against the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without a frown on your forehead or a crack in your voice? How do you tolerate this? Wa ana ashadu ala Rasulillah, and I testify that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Mimma sami'at udhunaya, which my ears heard, وَوَعَاهُ قَلْبِي and my heart preserved فَإِنِّي لَمْ أَكُنْ أَرْوَى عَنْهُ كَذِبًا I will never speak a lie against the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم يَسْأَلُنِي عَنْهُ إِذَا لَقِيتُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He would question me on the day of Qiyamah We were sitting with him one day and he said أَبُو بَكْرٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَعُمَرْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَعُثْمَانْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَعَلِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ he got to the ninth person the prophet of allah went on he said this one is in paradise this one this one and even the ninth one but i didn't mention his name but if you want i'll mention his name faraja ahlul masjid they all got up he said please please tell us who was the ninth one he said with great modesty i say i was the ninth one present and the prophet said to me you are in paradise but i chose not to because i didn't want to obviously flatter myself but he said to me, you are also in paradise. And the Prophet of Allah was the 10th person amongst us. He said, every one of them are in paradise. And then Sa'id ibn Zayd said, لَمَشْهَدٌ شَهِدَهُ رَجُلٌ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ يُغَبَّرُ فِيهِ وَجْهُهُ خَيْرٌ مِنْ, من عَمَلِ أَحَدِكُمْ وَلَوْ عُمِّرَ عُمْرَ نُوحٍ If a person spent one moment with the Prophet wasallam in which his face became dusty, is greater in merit and reward than the worship of an individual, even if his life extends to the lifespan of Nuh alayhi salam. Even if you are favored with the lifespan of Nuh alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam's lifespan was not 950. Many people confuse this. 950 was his period of Dawah. Read all the tafsirs, you will know what I'm saying. At the age of 40, at the age of 40, he became a prophet. Thereafter, he preached for 950, that brings it to 990. And thereafter, he lived an additional 60 years. Over a thousand was his lifespan. Even if he was given the lifespan of Nuh alayhi salam, he cannot equate, it cannot be equal in value, in merit, in reward to a moment spent with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, I just want to wrap up and bring it to a conclusion on certain points. What's the way forward? What's the way forward? There is a chapter in Hayat al-Sahaba, and that's the final chapter with which the kitab concludes, and that is, مَاذَا قَالَتِ الْأَعْدَاءُ مَاذَا قَالَتِ الْأَعْدَاءُ فِي غَلَبَةِ الصَّحَابَةِ عَلَيْهِمْ You know, they say, here's it from the horse's mouth. This is a dedicated chapter on what the enemies of Islam said regarding the victory and the prosperity and the prominence of Sahaba. Why they prospered? What was their secret? What was their strategy? So I'll just share with you two, three narrations. Abu Ishaq's narration. Hiraqal, who was the Roman emperor, 
repeatedly his army had to face defeat. So one day he engaged his people. He said, these people that you fight, alaysu basharam mithlakum, are they human beings or are they some other creatures? They said, no, no, they are human beings. Okay. Antum akthar amhum akthar. Do you number more or do they number more? He said, بَلْ نَحْنُ أَكْثَرُ مِنْهُمْ أَضْعَافًا فِي كُلِّ مَوْطِنِ We number more than them on every instance. So Heracles was more amazed, more perplexed, more puzzled. He said, فَمَا بَالُكُمْ تَنْهَزِمُونَ Then why do you lose? فَقَالَ شَيْخٌ مِّنْ عُضَمَائِهِمْ One of the prominent people from their side, let me be honest to you, مِنْ أَجْلِ أَنَّهُمْ يَقُومُونَ اللَّيْلِ وَيَصُومُونَ النَّهَارِ مِنْ أَجْلِ أَنَّهُمْ يَقُومُونَ اللَّيْلِ وَيَصُومُونَ النَّهَارِ وَيُوفُونَ بِالْعَهْدِ وَمِنْ أَجْلِ أَنَّا نَشْرَبُ الْخَمْرَ وَنَزْنِي وَنَرْكَبُ الْحَرَامِ وَنُفْسِدُ فِي الْأَرْضِ قال أنت صدقتني He said, O oh Emperor, Your Excellency, Your Majesty, let me, let, me, let me spell it out in reality. The secret of these people is by night, they are in prayer with their Creator. By night, they are in prayer with their Creator. تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنٍ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ Their sides are separated from their beds. يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ Supplicating their Creator. خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا in hope and fear فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ No soul knows مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ That which has been concealed for them in the coolness of their eyes The verses are so many They perform salah by night They fast by day They honor their words They respect their words Muslim or non-Muslim When they give their word, they honor it On the reverse we engage in ad- we we in- indulge in adultery we commit wrong we consume alcohol and we bring corruption on the earth we number more than them we we are armed to our teeth we have artillery we have weapons but we never can overpower them when hiraqal heard this he said you have spoken the truth this is where the secret is O muslim identify your strength O oh Muslim, recognize your ability. O oh Muslim, capitalize on your resources. The next narration, Ibn Jarir. Hiraqal meets a prisoner who was captured by the Muslims and managed to escape. He said, tell me about these people. He said, I will tell you as if you can view them. Fursanun bin nahar, rohbanun bil layl. Horsemen by day, monks by night. لا يأكلون من ذمتهم إلا بثمن. They will govern and rule, but they will never abuse or exploit the non-Muslims living in their country. That's what he mentioned. What did he say? They will be horsemen by day, monks by night in worship. لا يأكلون من ذمتهم إلا بثمن. They will never abuse. A non-Muslim living under the sovereignty of Islam, they will show respect, dignity, and honor to him and treat him with fairness and justice. Next narration, Ibn Jarir as well. The battle of Yarmouk, Qubuqlar, who was the general of the army, they just couldn't penetrate the rank of the Muslim. He called one person. He said, camouflage yourself. Penetrate their ranks. Stay undetected and report to me and tell me what are they doing behind the scenes. What are they doing behind the scenes? Once I was in California in Ramadan. <coughs> so they have this, uh, you know, open day. That's what they call it, open day. Where they invite fellow non-Muslims to come and watch, observe the masjid. Just to, to bridge the gap and to foster better relations. And to have greater levels of transparency. So I was asked to give a talk. I was the visiting scholar there and I was conducting discourses there. And mashallah, it was good, it was wholesome, it was wonderful. 
But just look at the negativity of media, media, the stereotyping. So obviously in the last 10 days of Ramadan, we have, you know, areas that are designated and we have cubicles for people that are sitting in Atikaf. And I was given a brief presentation on Islam, the beauty, the character, etc. That's a pulpit, that's a prayer, that's a holy Quran, this is what we do. So there was one sister there, and what do you have there behind those curtains? I said, there's nothing, sister. Lift it and raise it. We have people sleeping there, that's about it. But I guess the perception, the mindset, the negativity, what's happening? We have absolutely nothing. We are as a clean slate as you want. Come in and have a look. We have no agenda, no sinister agenda, no malicious intentions. Our deen by its very nature suggests peace to the entire world. Islam is peace with your creator, peace with yourself, peace with fellow humans, nay peace with fellow... We have to respect the other creatures that inhabit the earth. Peace in every form. But today people don't want peace, they want a piece of the land. There's different ways you can sell, spell peace. You know, people don't believe in prophets as in P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. Everybody believes in prophets as in P-R-O-F-I-T-S. Go in the ranks of the Muslims and see what they do. He goes, he comes back. He says, I've studied their lives. Comes back with the same story. Fursanum bin nahar, rohbanum bin layl. One thing is, by night they are monks, by day they are horsemen. But another amazing thing about them... Nobody amongst them is above the law. لو سرق ابن ملكهم قطعوا يده. If the child of their leader or their prophet has to steal, they will even chop the hands of their own prophet's child. This is their beauty. There's no bribery. There's no corruption. There's no distortion. There's no black hand, backhand. Everything is transparent. He said, "La in sadaqtani, la in sadaqtani, la batnu al ardi khayrum min liqaiha ulai ala dhahriha." If you are honest in what you say, I'll prefer being beneath the earth than dare challenge these people on the face of this earth. The next narration, and I draw it to a close. Yes, the Jard, he was the emperor of Persia. He was facing setback, so he wrote to one of his allies, the king of that time, his ally, and he said, please, I need reinforcement. So the king said, I understand loyalty, courtesy calls that we must be faithful to one another, but I, I fail to comprehend the logistics. You are outnumber the Muslims, but you're facing defeat at their hands. It can only possibly happen either you having a, a pitfall, a downfall, and they really having an upper hand, some certain good which you're not living up to. Can I ask you a few questions before I dispatch reinforcement? He said, go for it. Number one, are you funa bil ahdi? Look at the questions. Understand where our strength lies. Do this nation of Muslims honor their agreements in their transactions? Do they honor what they do? He said, yes, they are very, very honorable. They are people of their word. They will never go against their word. Head on the block, the man gave you his word, he will honor it. And write to them in the Quran, the tale of Ismail. He was a man who honored his word. In the tafsir it is written, he promised a man to meet at a place. That person didn't come there. Ismail alayhi salam went to that location at that time for one entire year. If somebody tells us 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 11 or 1, we're leaving. That's it. Before Nabu, before the Prophet would of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he had an agreement with someone to meet at a place for three days. The Prophet Sassam went there daily. And the person only came after the third day. And Nabi Sassam said, I've been coming here, honoring my word, and you haven't been here. You've caused me inconvenience. I don't have to tell you, if somebody delays us, we will swear him in all the languages we know. Starting off from our local language, going into our family language, and perhaps ending off in English. Yes, that's it. Every language, whatever vulgarity we know, we will give him the full wrath of our anger. A yufuna bil ahdi, do they honor their words? Yes, they honor their words. Number two, kayfa ta'atuhum umara'ahum. 
is this a nation that honors the sentiments of their leaders or they constantly rebel? He said, they're very compliant. They respect seniors. Okay. Are you harrimuna ma hullila lahum? Are you halliluna ma hurrima alayhim? Do they temper with the laws of Allah? Do they manipulate things and look for loopholes and leeways to legitimize the unlawful? No, not at all. He said, okay, it's a done deal. Listen, make peace with them. It's easier to move a mountain than to topple a nation like this.